Have you got the papers that Chinaman gave you? Here it is, Dad. Is it a surprise? Yes, Boogie. In the past, this information has been suppressed, but now it can be told. Every man, woman, and mutant on this planet shall know the truth about de-evolution. Oh, Dad, we're all evil. <laughs> Continuing our examination of nerd culture, we have yet to really cover the final rise of nerd culture to the prominence it sees today within the mainstream and what I perceive to be its eventual downfall. Now to this point and in the previous video, I discussed nerd culture as primarily part of the counterculture or the progressive counterculture that came in in the 60s and 70s. Indeed, the figure of the nerd was an archetype created mainly in the early 20th century due to increased consumption paired with a certain amount of honesty about a particular kind of person. But the formation of this character into a uh, identity all its own emerged much later and i would argue it was very quickly incorporated into the progressive coalition of parties dissatisfied with western society generally the nerd even had a kind of victim status to it when contrasting the desired nerd lifestyle against the more classical views of ideal masculinity or in some cases ideal femininity moreover the association of the nerd with science dovetailed nicely with the progressive movement's own scientific outlook on the world. And indeed, through the 80s and through the 90s, these forces were pretty much consistently in effect. But I think they were rather accelerated during the administration of George W. Bush, a president that the left went to great lengths to characterize as particularly pig-headed, obtuse, and anti-intellectual. This combined with a contested election against a vice president who later rebranded himself as a science popularizer, the left progressive movement was really ready to rebrand itself as the advocate for the smartest man in the room who was unjustly tossed aside due to the oppressive expectations of masculinity and other demands of Western society. And of course, the archetype of the nerd was the perfect vehicle for this message. This was only further complemented by the fact that during this time, during the early 2000s, the Bush administration seemed to preside over a series of institutional failures from almost almost all of the classic American institutions. It kicked off in the wake of a scandal in the energy sector that brought down the mega-giant Enron. It continued through a priest sex abuse scandal in the Catholic Church and several high-profile persistent scandals in the evangelical churches. This, in turn, was only further augmented by an intelligence failure leading to a bloody entangled war in Iraq and a global financial crisis that finally brought the Bush administration to a close in 2007 to 2008. Authority was failing everywhere, except for a few sectors. Science was continuing to generate cool new gadgets, Hollywood was finally learning how to fully realize the CGI technology it had just tasted in the 90s and was generating quite good films. And the one area of consistent economic growth seemed to be Silicon Valley. And at the center of all of these successes, once more, was the figure of the geek or the nerd. The smart guy. The figure of intelligence who was unjustly cast aside from society and not listened to. It was during this moment in 2007 to 2008 when I think nerd and geek culture really arrived at the mainstream. At this point, new tech companies like Google were beginning to dominate the scene. A new interest in global warming as sort of a forgotten science was seizing the nation. And a highly intellectual president had just gotten elected. Everything seemed to say, all we have to do is put the smart people in charge. Our problems aren't that difficult. Just 
Don't be stupid. Don't be evil. And whatever you do, don't stifle the smart people. And out of this came new cultural and new political forces that seemed to really capture this feeling that we were finally listening to the smart ones. And the two examples that sit most prominently on my mind are the TV show The Big Bang Theory and the New Atheist Movement. Now, I know a lot of people these days know Big Bang Theory as sort of a cringeworthy sitcom, but Believe it or not, there was a moment in 2007 where young people actually thought this show was cool and funny. It seemed, at least then, that this was a show that you wouldn't see in the 1990s. I mean, a lot of this was pretension. There were sitcoms that regularly featured nerds. This was just a staple of any teen comedy going back, like I said, into the 60s. But nevertheless, for a while, The Big Bang was trying to communicate a, a refocus. Again, continuing on that cultural shift, that Revenge of the Nerds tried to kick off. And it seemed from that point, this idea that the nerd was the ideal, it just spilled into almost everywhere. You had journalists like Melissa Harris Perry commandeer titles for their shows like Nerdland. You had smart and funny actresses like Felicia Day suddenly discover their hidden introvert just in time to make very, very successful web series about well, nerds. And you even had the White House press correspondence dinner retitle itself or dub itself Nerd Prom. And throughout all of this, you can sort of tell this was predominantly a left-wing phenomenon. But like all left-wing phenomenons, sort of paradoxically, just as the particular group was writhing at an apex of their public exposure in media, so too was a certain weird type of oppression narrative kicking up from certain areas of both the writing industry and also the internet. And this oppression narrative really came in the form of the New Atheist movement. Now, I've made my criticism of the New Atheists, and you know, some of them I even have a great deal of respect for. But culturally, to a large degree during this time, the tirade that the New Atheists made against all forms of organized religion opened up an enormous number of avenues for people to, in many ways, share in the victim narrative so thoroughly promoted by the progressive movement. Of course, there were sort of the classic type of bookwormy individual who felt or still feels he didn't get a fair shake on many of his life's ambitions using his identity as a nerd and an atheist to both find a political identity on the left, but also strike back against many elements of the culture they felt were holding them down. And here a perfect example of this would be someone like Bob Chipman, a man whose sole source of identity is really in being a nerd, and who coincidentally sees the soul, object of evil, anything and everything from the right, and everything and anything involving religion. But in addition to the bookish and nerdy individuals jumping on many of the victim narratives put into play by the new atheism, there also were a large variety of thoroughly ordinary and not particularly eccentric people that I met during this time who were very willing to sign on to the atheist narrative, not really because they had any strong beliefs one way or the other, but more because, yet again, it gave them an ability to share in the progressive victim mentality. I had numerous friends and family members at this time talk to others about leaving their own faith tradition behind in harrowing terms. I mean, these people had minimal faith upbringings, but they still talked about their final decision to become atheists as if they were escaping from some kind of Westboro Baptist church cult. I mean, I don't want to put down anyone's experiences, but considering that this was the San Francisco Bay Area in the first decade of the 21st century, I'm not exactly sure that fundamentalist cults were thick on the ground nor would coming out as an atheist really lose you any friends, least of all among the people who are your employers. So, that being said, if this moment was indeed the, the high point of nerd culture, and if in some ways it dovetailed with the new atheist movement, what eventually happened? Well, a uh, mere passage of time happened. A lot of the narratives being used to hold together the concept of nerd culture really weren't holding a lot of weight. There wasn't really a lot there. Once you got through sort of the idea of accepting eccentric, smart people, 
people, there weren't a lot of issues to fight for, and the left-wing coalition certainly wasn't going to elevate nerds or geeks to some kind of protected group. The whole trope became tired. I mean, I mean, just to use the Big Bang Theory as a convenient example, there's only so many times you can make fun of people overly obsessed with the minutia of science and science fiction, and pretty soon people want details about character. People want details about desire. You have to make your own TV show, in the case of the Big Bang Theory, more interesting than just the raw stereotypes of the characters that inhabit it. And similarly, you have to make your political movement more substantive than a metaphysical denial, an obsession with the idea of intelligence, and a much too played out semi-oppression narrative. In short, nerd culture and geek culture needed to develop more than just a critique of the mainstream culture. Nerd culture and geek culture needed to develop an identity. It needed to develop character. And character, to borrow a nerd term that later became a progressive term can be very problematic. Because once you stand for something and have some agency, your position in a cultural or political coalition isn't necessarily as easy to accommodate. And of course, I think most of my viewers can tell what I'm suddenly referencing, and that of course is Anita Sarkeesian and Gamergate. Now, I've talked a lot about Gamergate and the fallout. I, in fact, think it's one of the first cracks in the progressive coalition, which is my best explanation for why a lot of progressives I know can't shut up about it, even if they don't play video games. I've discussed it in many other videos, but suffice to say that as a member of the Progressive Coalition, there is going to be a time when that community's interests are either absorbed totally into the progressive movement itself, or whether it stands up and resists. And to its credit, for all its other weaknesses, a large part of what people called nerd or geek culture decided to resist the progressive movement in the fall of 2015. But again, uh, much too much has been said about Gamergate, and in many ways, it's not as interesting as I think the moment we now occupy is. Because a funny thing happens when a group exits the Progressive Coalition, and that is, I think, it becomes an opportunity uh, for self-reflection. Because progressivism in general, if nothing else, somehow has this uncanny ability to shield the composite groups that make it up from self-reflection. Being a progressive means you never have to say you're sorry. Being part of a group that progressives consider a victim group means that you never actually have to reflect upon the manifest cultural problems that your community might have. Briefly, we can just look at two or three of, of the primary constituents of the progressive movement today. Uh, the African American community, the gay community, both of these groups have huge cultural issues really obvious cultural issues that if they were not actually part of the progressive coalition would, would be called out really on a regular basis by the culture, by mainstream culture and media. Consider behavior like bug chasing or just general promiscuity on the part of the gay community. How many times has that been represented in media? How many times has that been brought to the attention of the American public on a regular basis? Almost never, because they're part of the progressive coalition. They're the victims. It will be funny to see if the gay community ever leaves the progressive coalition, whether we will actually be able to address these problems in a more sane fashion, but, but that's neither here nor there. What is more on topic is the opportunity of examining nerd culture apart from any victim or oppression narratives it built up in the previous decades. Aside from the fact that we may have been bullied in high school, that we may have been less popular with women than we've liked, despite the fact that we feel like we're the unacknowledged smart people, what does nerd or geek culture look like in 2017? And here I think if we take an honest look, we have to come to some pretty harrowing conclusions. The process of making this video, I took a look at some of the nerd culture content out there on YouTube. And just an honest assessment of this indicates that in many ways, nerd culture suffers from a variety of large cultural problems that even nerds themselves admit to. And here, I, I can submit just three observations that seem almost damning, because it strikes me that one, nerd culture is based and founded on consumption. Two, is obsessed with status. And three, as utterly non-reflexive 
and complacent about the status quo. And I'll remark on each of these accusations independently to sort of illustrate what I'm saying. But first, on the observation that nerd culture is fundamentally about consumerism, I mean, you just have to take a look at any prominent channel that deals in nerd culture. I mean, there's there's tons of these channels, from Felicia Day to Boogie2988, and, and every time, the image is very clear. You've got the person in front of the camera, and behind him, and he's got just this wall of pristinely mint condition consumer items. Stacks of board games, all the video game titles all lined up. A wall of manga and anime. And I mean, you know, it's not like I don't have things. It's not like I don't have books and movies around my own apartment. But when it comes to these front pages of nerd culture, people who are selling themselves as, as sort of people who talk about nerd culture, this is obviously an affect. This is obviously a demonstration about what makes them part of this community what makes them a true nerd and of course it always comes down to consumption and you know the content of these channels it isn't that different very rarely with some exceptions they don't usually talk about ideas they don't usually talk about developing skills they don't usually talk about cultural criticism at least in the way we would usually think of cultural criticism in sort of that Siskel and Ebert type way where you're, where you're actually critically engaging with the product oftentimes it seems that half of these channels they're just promotional. They're there to make the people who watch them feel good about the products they already consume. And I know, I mean, this isn't an open secret. I mean, you know, Red Letter Media, one of the largest channels that does critical media, it, it did a sort of a parody of this, where they do this satire of, of a nerd media channel, and it's all just a bunch of simpering fanboys talking endlessly about the newest product. Seem to have a love of basically every movie that comes out with almost a blind automaton like fanboy mentality and i love getting into movies early so you know if they want a positive review that's that's what they'll get it really makes you feel better than everybody else once you get in to see a film early we're all bonded we have a connection and that connection is is nerd culture or geek culture as they say you know we all like the same thing we would like to thank our sponsor uh, geek crate geek crate will send you a crate. It's an actual crate. And it's filled with cheap dollar store toys with your favorite logos on them. The geek culture, pop culture items that you crave. Now, the thing is, the items themselves uh, cost way less than what you pay for the service. But it really is about the experience. I personally uh, uh, love a geek crate because every month I, I get a box and whatever's in there might fill the empty void in my soul. I mean, you even see this in the Big Bang Theory sitcom. I mean, all these guys sitting around in it, it just apparent, like, is there any nerd product that these people haven't consumed? Is there any, like, superhero or Star Wars thing they haven't bought? I mean, in the spare time when they're not working, they're supposed to be sitting at their Amazon.com accounts, like, clicking buy on every single new product that comes out. And a lot of times this comes from this sort of fanboy or fangirl culture. It's almost like the cult of the celebrity, but, but transferred onto a totally fictional universe and in which case you're sort of idolizing not so much a personality but an intellectual property that's not to say that nerd culture doesn't complain about things because nerd culture actually does complain a lot but it but i think the critical thing is is it complains it never critiques there's really the minimal amount of biting quality to it because at the end of the day the environment is one of sycophancy people don't want deep criticism in this regard and of course there's sort of several elements to this. I mean, the first one is that you know, as nerd culture has progressed from the 60s, more and more and more of it has been consumed with nostalgia. People trying to essentially get back to the place they were when they first came in contact with this culture as children. And of course, when we're in a nostalgic mode, we, we very rarely want a critique. I think the second thing is just the movement of nerd culture to go to the lowest and lowest common denominator. And again, this is sort of re-underlines how this community is fundamentally about consumption. The identity of nerddom is consumption, and consumerism always goes to the lowest common denominator. And I, I can already anticipate sort of the counter-criticism. Well, Distributist, doesn't everything go to the lowest common denominator? Aren't you taking a general phenomenon that we see in society at large and just blaming it in particular on 
on nerds and nerd culture? Eh, there's some truth there, perhaps, but when you really look to it, is it, is it true that everything goes to the lowest common denominator? I mean, if we just compare nerd culture to sort of the classic rival of nerd culture, jock culture, there are many pathological elements about sports culture, but it's fundamentally less about consumption. You're out there playing a game, you're trying to perfect your technique, and at the end of the day, baseball is about hitting a home run, not about buying a certain product. I mean, of course, uh, given the side that there is sort of a baseball fan culture that's very much about consumption, but that just gets back to the fundamental nature of nerd culture itself as being something that stems from an idolization, that stems from a fan culture, because that's what fans do. They they idolize and they consume. And you know, fair enough, you know, I, I have things that, that I'm a fan of. I would be lying if I said I never collected anything. We all have our little distractions and vices and all that stuff. But when I think of nerd culture and geek culture, the way I described it in this episode and the previous one, we're describing something that for a lot of people was their primary identity. I and mean, they saw themselves as nerds first and foremost in a lot of regards, uh, especially after the 90s. A lot of people really had this as a primary identity. They'd say, I'm a nerd. They, they would wear it on their sleeve. And I've always thought I mean, having a primary identity like that, that at the end of the day is fundamentally about being a fan and being a consumer, must be really depressing. And I know there's a sports analogy. I mean, people are walking around with all this paraphernalia and jerseys. And the YouTuber Black Pigeon Speaks, uh, he had this devastating critique where he sort of criticized sports fandom as people who would pay $100 to wear another man's name on their back. But I mean, doesn't nerd culture just take it to the next level? Because in many cases, nerds are willing to pay hundreds of dollars to have a fictional man's name on their back. I mean, it's not even a real person. It's, a, it's an intellectual property owned by a corporation. And that must be depressing. But that just leads me to my, my next criticism, because I think in a lot of ways, being a fan or a consumer is sort of fundamentally depressing. And, and the way that a lot of people deal with it, you know, as opposed to perhaps the more healthy way of just finding another identity and having the collection and the fandom be a more minor part of your own identity, the way that a lot of people, however, deal with it is they, they create sort of status hierarchies. An issue I've seen uh, far too often inside nerd culture and geek culture of counter-signaling against whatever the normies are doing, or whatever people perceive the mainstream as liking. I think this is sort of a natural way of living with consumerism is that we constantly try to consume different things that we think set ourselves aside. Probably nothing I'm going to say at this moment in time is going to convince anybody in 2017 that the Big Bang Theory was indeed something that the cool kids watched when it first came out. I mean, it's laugh-tracked television, and it's it's become almost routine to make fun of the, the banality of the humor and the stupidity of people who, who like it. But perhaps a more pertinent example is the more recent phenomenon of Rick and Morty. The show is about a smart person just like the Big Bang Theory is, but what the show will never admit to its own audience is that it subtly suggests throughout the course of the series that, that by watching it and by liking it, you are sort of sharing in the intelligence and, and aloofness of the main character. The main character in Rick and Morty, Rick Sanchez, is an, an aloof and elitist sociopath who sees all the rest of humanity as just grazing sheep totally beneath him, totally beneath his regard. They're mindless consumers who can't even think for themselves. And, and of course, he, he combines this with sort of a nihilism and a bleakness that gives the show sort of its edginess and its character, and coincidentally keeps away the normies, or at least we thought. But what's sort of blindingly obvious at this point is just to the extent that the point of view of this character in the show invites the audience itself to, to associate with this aloof personality that is so far beyond all of this stupid grazing cattle that comprise the rest of humanity. And that sort of find a living embodiment in the show's butt monkey, the dumpy straight white male Jerry, which is constantly the target of Rick's ire. And here you, you see how this signaling that Rick embodies is kind of the perfect interface uh, with the consumerism. Rick Sanchez lives in a meaningless universe of which it's pointless to care about anything else but just animal consumption. However, Rick Sanchez isn't 
unlike any of those other mindless consumers, he's the guy who has all the answers and is above everyone else. So, Rick and Morty viewer, it doesn't matter if your identity is totally about consumption and self-gratification. It doesn't matter if there's no higher purpose or meaning. You're one of the smart people. You're one of the ones that can brave the edginess and nihilism and darkness of the show and really set yourself apart as one of the smart people. And of course, even though you're one of the smart people, it doesn't really matter. There's no obligation because at the end of the day, there really isn't anything to care about. And this really leads us into the final problem, and that is nerd culture's persistent complacency and satisfaction with the status quo. And this is sort of a more recent development, I think, in nerd culture. There seems to be this overwhelming tendency, this overwhelming belief inside this entire sphere that where we are right now, the place of comfort we have, that is the good thing and we shouldn't be striving for anything more. We shouldn't really be fighting hard to make things different. We, we don't want large change. I mean, of course, we want advancement. We want the iPhone 10 to turn into the iPhone 11. We want the Xbox to turn into the Xbox 360. But we don't want the pattern of playing the Xbox game to significantly change. I mean, in some sense, this is partially surprising, considering that in some ways, the image of the nerd and geek was a little bit more rebellious and countercultural in earlier generations. And I think a lot of it just comes down to the fact that the products associated with nerd culture Culture, like video games, have gotten much more addictive, uh, much more immersive. And the entire industry ha has moved away from edification and challenging products and more towards products that can be consumed habitually. And I guess at this point, I, I really can't avoid a discussion of video games because they really are the elephant in the room. Because I've talked to many people who've logged thousands and thousands of hours on single video games. And I just don't think there, there really were products products like this before, where people's in entire free time could just be devoured by a single experience. And I think people get very used to having a video game experience, and this combined with a number of other things I've mentioned on this episode have, have resulted in a nerd culture that's really more concerned about getting its fix and keeping things going than it is about standing up and challenging things. And even while I think the industries that serve this population of people are really taking advantage of their audience. And in many ways, I think that people who consider themselves nerds have a lot of things to be really angry about, a lot of reasons not to be complacent, but still, again and again, you encounter this attitude, just let me play my video games. Just let me have this little fantasy world that I can exist in. Just give me the next hit. And as long as that hit isn't injected with too many things that make me feel uncomfortable, whether it's the SJW things that make me uncomfortable, or whether it is other cultural elements that allude to the fact that this is not sustainable, I just don't care. I just want to have things persist. And so when we uncover these elements, I think a really dark picture is painted of modern nerd culture. I mean, what do we have? Consumerism, status counter signaling, and complacency. I, we've described the perfect corporate consumer. If EA Games, Microsoft, and Nintendo were to get together and engineer a culture of consumers that would complacently consume the next project iteration after iteration after iteration, these three qualities would have to be their top priority to inculcate. Yet somehow over the course of 20 or 30 years, these have become essential to what nerd culture means generally. And this is where I'm really starting with this critique of nerd culture. I'm finding nerd and geek culture in a place that I think nobody could think is preferable. To me, it would be a very depressing primary identity to hold. And I think these are very deep problems, but perhaps not the main problem. Because uh, regardless of what I said about these qualities being highly preferable to corporations, I don't think they were actually manufactured. But nevertheless, I do think that there was a larger problem that drove these issues into contemporary nerd and geek culture. It was always kind of unclear to me what that force was, but I, I was, I think, finally able to come to an explanation that satisfied me. And coincidentally, the revelation was illustrated by an episode of Rick and Morty.